The glaciers are on the move, and Ice Age Adventures of Buck Wild is finally here. Buck Wild is an adventurous weasel we were introduced to earlier in the saga. You remember my daughter? Bronwyn! His From Down Under persona called for its own chapter in the Ice Age stories. And who better to explore it than our favorite and furry problem possums Crash and Eddie. I'm Kyle with Wicked Binge. And this is Ice Age, The Adventures of Buck Wild, Good to Evil. Now, forget that good and evil were hardly concepts back in the Ice Age. We'd still like to rank our favorite characters accordingly. That said, we're going to keep our list strictly to the characters we see in The Adventures of Buck Wild. With the rules out of the way, let's dive in. As usual, we'll be starting with the most noble character and working our way down. These characters are kind, friendly, and morally upright. They are the good. Let's get started with Buck Wild, the titular character of the movie who Crash and Eddie are already familiar with, and the most good-hearted member. Buck is hands down our character with the best qualities spanning from friendly and caring to fearlessly adventurous. Aside from rushing into action without planning anything, his heart always seems to naturally dwell in the right place. Originally, he and his old team established a peaceful time of order that provided harmony for all living creatures throughout the Lost World. When the pair Crash and Eddie couldn't lie straight to Buck, he could sense that something was up. And when he finally got to the bottom of things, his first aim was to bring the audacious boys back home. I've got to take you back home, fellas! Later on, we even learn of how much guilt he still holds himself to after losing almost his entire team. This probably made him think going solo and laying low was the best option to protect his remaining friends from the dinosaurs. After Z convinces him to get back on the saddle, and too many encounters with an evil genius hungry for revenge, Buck pointed his sights on thwarting the villain and bringing an end to his rise of dominating the watering holes. This selflessness isn't displayed in many other characters aside from his like-minded colleague Z. Buck can keep the momentum going even if the Pax Hunter returns home empty-handed. He gathers the supplies needed for the group to be able to move forward. This can also go as far as including events and individual characters, even his enemies. Now, I know what you're thinking, Buck should totally be the Hunter. But let's boil it down with how Z is constantly the one to save Buck when things start to get a bit hairy. If it wasn't for her, the gang would never have gotten together to stop Orson from ruling the Lost World. Even though he can be a set him up and knock him down guy on his own, he faces whatever obstacle too often alone and on a whim. It's only after distracting his opponent for his partner to finally hop in and give a better hand. But that kind of intricate plan is a little too advanced for Buck. For thick, hammer-headed characters like him, everything looks like a nail. Our silver medal of good goes to Z, Buck's faithful companion and last remaining member of his old crew. She's the closest match with Buck compared to anyone else in the Lost World. They both go way back to a time shared when they basically served the inhabitants as a league of superheroes righting the wrongs of a pre-civilized community. As the movie progresses, we can see that there is a string of tension between her and Buck for the terrible cost of their old team. Clearly, Z never let that debt go by unpaid, and so she began tracking the villainous reptile long before Crash and Eddie fell into Buck's lap. There's still a call of duty that Z takes very seriously, and it appears to drive her crazy that Buck's answer was to walk away and leave the mess in efforts to preserve what they still had. This is another reason why she's so essential for him facing this kind of peril and responsibility. Even though she's her own individual character, Z acts as the yang to Buck's yin. As crazy and fearless as Buck may be, his perspective from the outback needs some insight to coordinate a solid plan. He's always rushing into the middle of things, and Z manages to pull him out of harm's way time and time again. Her balance to him is probably the only thing keeping Buck alive, even from out of sight or under a distant shrub. The real heroine of this story is Z for basically carrying the team when Buck was down, and for keeping the entire story on track. Buck was going to waltz the boys back home before Z finally caught up with them after tracking Orson and his raptor peons. But more importantly, she had been waiting for Buck to finally come back around and finish what they started. 
Only under the condition, however, that Buck finally began making a plan for things instead of going in like a ball of claws and fur. Is the team getting back together again? You stay out of it, you! She was cunning enough to stay under everyone's radar, and smart enough to know that taking time to make a plan is crucial when facing challenges. Ultimately, Z was the glue that brought back her and Buck's team after it dissolved long ago. Without her stealth and wit, everyone would have become dinner for the dinosaurs at one point or another. Sliding in at third with our bronze medal of good is Mama T, another character we were introduced to earlier in this saga. Although she didn't play much of a bigger role than Manny, Ellie, Diego, or Sid in this movie, she was certainly helpful to Buck with keeping both Crash and Eddie safe or at least when not being knocked out by Z's noxious gas. They were unfortunate with horrible time to get a bad tooth pulled, and this leads up to Buck's capture. A huge dinosaur like that could have come into some serious use fending off the raptor pack, and we see her kick some butt later in the movie. But let's mention how fast the T-Rex Express was able to get Ellie and the herd down to the Lost World, in time to help the gang. Ultimately, Mama T was just doing what a good friend does, lending a tiny hand when caught between a rock and a hard place. Sure, they may be individual twin brothers, but Crash and Eddie both think and act too much alike to get their own places. They're more two halves of a whole brain than separate individual characters in many ways. And that's where their innocence might have such a strong influence on their actions between each other. Although they have a keen sense for finding themselves into trouble, that rascality is just a side effect of their curious independence. Some might say it's their fault for running away without saying goodbye, but let's keep in mind that Manny pushed them a bit to hit the road. They are twins, so even Buck had trouble identifying who was who. In the end, we were shown how the pair became more responsible and really stepped up their game helping Z rescue Buck. All thanks to her training them, of course. Next up we have Ellie, the twins' protective mammoth of a sister. In this movie, however, she certainly fills more of a motherly role looking after the boys. Playing peacekeeper, when everyone starts butting heads, sets her off on Manny for challenging the twins to go off and live independently. So clearly, all she wants is for everyone to stick together and get along, even though the herd wants to split apart. That herd is her entire life's only sense of family. Crash and Eddie had been a part of their sister's life for even longer, and the passing of their shared mother, had only strengthened their unrelenting duty to watch over her little brothers. This never necessarily had to be her responsibility, but that kind of job can fall onto anyone's shoulders without notice or even choice. The lesson that usually follows is learning to let them move on when they're ready, which she does learn, to let her loved ones go and grow to be their own individuals by the end of the movie. Ellie's motherly instincts and pack orientation is what earns her such a good ranking on our list. Our final good character is Sid, the poster sloth of our favorite herd. Next to that nut-chasing, glacier-moving rodent, Scrat, of course. Sid clearly has zero plan besides staying alive. But when things get serious, he cares very deeply about anyone if they ever begin to wander too far from their oddball herd. However, his dopiness, and lack of intelligence or common sense for that matter, had to land him a bit further down our list. At some point, not taking the initiative to sharpen wits is about the same as choosing to stay willfully oblivious. This immediately makes his survival a responsibility of someone else in the herd, and prehistoric eras don't typically contain the best moments to just go with the flow. How many times can we count where predators almost enjoyed a big dish of mammoth with a side of sloth in the movies? But his obliviousness doesn't come from a bad place by any means. He's just trying his best. Time and time again, Sid proves to us how much of a dimwit he can be. His stroke of luck with fire and evading hunters turning him into lunch just kind of shows how lucky he is. The most intelligent choice he made throughout the movies was probably clinging to massive herbivores for shelter in an effort to survive. That and making friends with Mama T after watching after her babies in Dawn of the Dinosaurs. He definitely has a good heart, but even his family left him behind. So how much of a threat do you have to pose for those around you to sneak away in the midst of migration? With the good characters out of the way, we now move into more neutral territory. This is the gray area. 
Let's be honest, Manny was never much of a herd member after losing his mate and child to human hunters. And he never really seemed to fall far from that either, even after meeting Ellie and the boys. In fact, Manny seems kind of annoyed and fed up with Crash and Eddie at best. But Manny's hot temper and quick reactions blabbed a little too much for the entire mess to transpire, provoking the twins to go off and live on their own. Like he did is exactly what set the entire adventure into motion. If he just kept his mouth shut, they all might have found a better solution than baiting Crash and Eddie to hit the road. Because the chances of them finding their own way in a world far less than merciful to small critters were slim to none. And coming from someone that's seen how ruthless it can get, Manny probably knew it was a matter of time before they became lunch. Moving further down the list, we have Diego. Again, being honest, he only began interacting with Manny and Sid because he was hunting the hunter's child. And it was only after throwing down his own pack to save Manny and Sid that allowed him to survive. Although his sense of family displayed by protecting Sid from a pack of surrounding raptors was a sign of improvement, we can't put too big of a bet that a carnivore won't eat a sloth when the food runs out. One thing that caught the audience by surprise was his teary-eyed moment when Crash and Eddie said goodbye and chose to stay with Buck and Z in the Lost World. Is that a tear in your eye, Diego? Finally, we get to our evil characters. This is the dark side. Although they may not be entirely evil, the Raptor Pack is definitely a group of vicious hunting predators. And even though Diego may share the same spot on the food chain, the Raptors appear to lack a sense of awareness. I guess expecting more from a reptile with a bird-sized brain was asking a little too much. By the end of the movie, they actually show a much kinder side to our mammal friends after the conflict. The rodents could even train the lot like dogs after changing leash from a bad owner like Orson. Where's your chew toy? Go get him! But regardless of who was holding their leash, they were too easily influenced. In fact, they even turn on their original master when Crash and Eddie mimic their favorite fire trick. So much for a loyal army. Their oafish demeanor is what brought these oblivious lizards all the way down here. But the worst of the worst, unsurprisingly, was Orson without a doubt. He was egotistical, self-centered, manipulative, and hungry to gain power more than his own natural instincts. The harmony Buck and the gang started was only necessary to maintain because of the strings Orson was pulling to climb his way up to the top. That big brain could have helped so much with building the world that the League envisioned and was on the verge of creating. But that would never be enough for him. Orson wanted control and to dominate the hidden world. A place where the strong survived because of the weak was no different than what nature already did naturally. So who would ever settle for that? Well, greedy, power-hungry, manipulative characters like Orson. Let's also not forget to mention his absolute helplessness without the combined strength of his raptors. Only in fits of rage did Orson ever charge at Buck or anyone himself. Usually, it was his army of grunts that would do all the dirty work, while he concocted some evil speech about it. As much of a villain as he might be, his realistic views on power are generally what kept him climbing up the food chain. I'm a genius who's about to rule the lost world. Even Buck's idealistic ways of a perfect world, living in harmony sounds like something out of a heartwarming fairy tale. And Orson, being no dummy, was not going to risk his life building some fantasy. He displays quite the ability commanding a horde of raptors. Eventually, we see this horde develops numbers to become an army and overrun the lost world and take down Buck Wild. Learning to control the bug-eyed reptiles with fire was either a stroke of genius or a flick of luck. Fortunately for Orson, his sharp awareness of realizing what to do next is what brought him so far from his island exile surrounded by lava. Quick wit and realization or awareness are some of the key ingredients that evolution tends to favor. And with our morality spectrum wrapped up, let's award some sinner medals. The Darwin Medal belongs to the twins Crash and Eddie. They aren't the most cunning members in their herd of misfits, and pretending to play dead can only work out for them so many more times. The Wrath Medal is given to Manny and his hot-headed temper. Maybe it was a long time coming, but going off the way he did at the twins was a bit excessive. There was probably a better way for them to understand each other better. The sloth metal is going to Sid. I think we all saw this coming. That mammal cannot seem to use his head. 
let alone get away fast. If it weren't for the fact that the fans loved him so much, he probably wouldn't have made it through the first movie, let alone four of them. The Pride Medal goes to Orson and his obsession with his own brilliant mind. Pride was definitely the root to his downfall, trying to seize power. But don't take all this as etched in stone. We're just looking at the pictures on the cave walls. Let us know in the comment section who you think the best character is, and what we should cover next. Don't forget to hit that notification bell and binge our Good to Evil playlist. But most importantly, stay wicked.